Hey everybody, it's Shu here, back for another Let's Play Community College, where we play games, have fun, and hopefully come out a little smarter than when we started. Today we're playing The Magic Circle and talking about Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. The Magic Circle is a bizarre first-person RPG adventure puzzle kind of hybrid game where you take on the role of a playtester caught in an unfinished epic that's been stuck in development hell for ten years. Word of warning, The Magic Circle is a story-driven game, and we're going to be going through some major spoilers here. If you like what you see, maybe save this video in your favorites, buy the game on Steam, and come back here when you've completed it. Now then, Fountain. To get the short history out of the way, in 1917, a group called the Society of Independent Artists held a show in New York in which they invited submissions from the public. It was a non-juried show, and the group claimed that no work would be rejected, provided the submitter joined the society and paid the modest entry fee. The idea was to make a show open to members of the avant-garde community, whose works were usually too next-level for juried art shows, which tended to favor established artists and styles. One member of this group, French-American artist Marcel Duchamp, used an alias Richard Mutt and secretly submitted a work called Fountain to the show. What was Fountain? A simple porcelain urinal turned on its side and signed Our Mutt, 1917. The toilet was rejected, and Duchamp and some associates resigned from the Society of Independent Artists in protest. Fast forward, and as recently as 2004, a poll of 500 international art experts picked Fountain as the single most important work of art of the 20th century. From getting kicked out of an Anything Goes art show to being called the most influential work of the century, how did we get here? I want to wheel this back for a second, because before we start talking about all the delicious backbiting and trash-talking that was going on in the New York art scene at the time, or really get into the theory of what was going on, I want to drive home just what an assault on contemporary taste it was to use a toilet. It might seem a little silly to us, but America had severe hang-ups about acknowledging body functions and plumbing for a long time. Even showing a toilet on television was taboo for a very long time. The first episode of Leave it to Beaver in 1957 almost never aired because it involved the Cleaver kids keeping a baby alligator in a toilet tank. It took numerous negotiations with the network before they compromised on just showing the top of the tank. A flushing toilet wouldn't be heard on TV until the 1970s on All in the Family. There wouldn't be a toilet on the silver screen until Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho in 1960. Now an R-rated movie. Even in the 1980s, Farside cartoonist Gary Larson had a cartoon nixed by an editor because it showed a kid playing the tuba behind an outhouse. We've eased up over time, but Duchamp picked a subject matter that many people considered obscene, and he knew that going in. It's important to understand that because it's one prong in a two-pronged attack that Fountain represented against popular sensibilities. Of course, there's more to it than simply an attack on convention and social mores, and it wasn't just a profound upending of fundamental concepts of art and authorship, we'll get to that. It was also a glorious piece of inside baseball trash talk among the New York art world, aimed at New York art dealer and critic Robert Cody. Cody was, among other things, an American nationalist. To put that as simply as possible, nationalism is kind of like a patriotism so intense it becomes a belief system in and of itself. A patriot loves their country. A nationalist argues that country and your relationship to it make up maybe the most fundamental part of who you are. It's your identity. And identity meant a lot to Cody in the context of American art. Cody felt that American art tried too hard to imitate Europe, and that its purest American art, the art most free of foreign influence, was its industrial design, its machines, its bridges, its locomotives, and so forth. In 1917, just a few months before the Society of Independent Artists exhibit where Duchamp would submit Fountain, Cody published a photo essay of American industrial design in a journal called The Soil, including a photo juxtaposition where he compared a Chambersburg double-frame steam hammer to the shape of a memorial for the USS Maine, a ship sunken by a mysterious explosion about 20 years prior, an explosion that was the impetus of the Spanish-American War. Those of you schooled on fascism might notice something's up here, what with the nationalism, naming of the journal, the soil, the purge of foreign influences, and you're dead on. Cody's work predates the era of fascism ever so slightly, but it's pretty clear where he's heading. Those of you who aren't up on fascism, don't worry, that episode's already in the works. The point is, Cody's ugly proto-fascism probably didn't sit well with Duchamp or the New York avant-garde art community, much of which was openly anarchist or anarchist-influenced. Adding fuel to the fire, Cody also heavily criticized another New York avant-garde art figure, Jean Crotty, and his sculpture portrait of Duchamp. So when Fountain was rejected from the Society of Independent Artists show, Duchamp and company used the publicity to take shots at Cody. 
An associate, artist Beatrice Wood, founder of the magazine The Blind Man, published a defense of the piece, including the line, quote, The only works of art America has given are her plumbing and her bridges. A vicious satirical shot at Cody in his belief that industrial art was the only true American art. But that's not all. By sitting the urinal on its side, Duchamp made the front face of Fountain mimic the form of the steam hammer in Cody's piece in the soil only months prior. Duchamp associate Alfred Stiglitz photographed the piece in such a way that the lighting and positive and negative space even imitated the form of the steam hammer. So put into context of the time, Duchamp and company took an unspeakably obscene object and did everything they could to hitch Cody's nationalist love of American industrial design to it. We're talking about an absolutely savage art world beatdown here, and it's an absolutely amazing story that gets lost so often because of the greater long-term significance of the piece. And that brings us to the meat of the story. What is this long-term significance that makes Fountain the most important work of art of the 20th century in so many experts' estimation? What's the big deal about a toilet, especially one that Duchamp didn't even make? Well, that's what the big deal is. The defense of the piece in the magazine The Blind Man sums it up. Quote, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object, end quote. Duchamp recognized that there was some kind of magical alchemy that happens in separating a piece as art, in presenting it as a statement or something to be appreciated and understood. What separates a commercial illustration from a piece of gallery art, other than the artist's decision to sell one piece and elevate the other to the status of art? You might compare it to photography in the way a photographer takes the world around us, but through how they position, how they manage light, and how they compose the shot, they can turn part of the everyday mundane world into art. Duchamp basically took this to a whole new level. By submitting a simple toilet, he took craftsmanship out of it entirely. There's no room for aesthetic judgment for a mundane and unexciting toilet. He didn't uncover some secret beauty. There's no compositional work other than turning it on its side. It's art because it was declared to be and submitted as such. I think you could understand most works of art to consist of three creative processes. The mental act of conceiving the work, the act of actual craftsmanship where you create the piece, and the receptive and interpretive act by the audience. This is the three-legged stool that makes art what it is, as we normally understand it. But by removing craftsmanship, Duchamp arguably brought us to the sine qua non of art, the absolute minimum, where nothing further can be removed. What's really extraordinary about it to me is that this piece celebrates the singular act of artistic genius, the moment where the artist conceives of the piece and the status of art, but arguably set the stage for the interpretive act of receiving and appreciating the art to really take primacy through the rest of the century. I would argue that by severing craftsmanship from art, by showing that it's not an indispensable part of this three-legged stool, Duchamp put the art world in a position where a creator and appreciator struggle as equals for control of what a work really means. In a world where craftsmanship is dispensable, who has the say on what a work of art means? It stands as this massive attack on the Romantic-era concept of authorship, as an art movement, Romanticism really only lasted through the 1800s, but the Romantic concept of the author is stuck with many of us today. This concept that a work of art is a singular act of genius by one person. A Romantic would say your work isn't influenced by the world around you, your upbringing, the achievements of everyone around you and before you. It's this singular act of genius born from the void after you were locked away to slave over your work. It's the line of thought that pretends that Led Zeppelin were just geniuses, rather than some decent musicians who were pretty good at coming up with new contexts for stolen blues riffs, for example. It shouldn't be a surprise that we see this line of thought really take off with the worldwide expansion of capitalism and copyright. There's a lot of money to be made in art and in selling art, and protecting it with copyright makes a lot more sense when you can argue that it's the individual creation of the author and nobody else. But it gets pretty hard to take seriously when you can create art like Fountain. Duchamp didn't lock himself away slaving over the piece until it was just right. He didn't use his creative gifts to determine the contours of the porcelain, or his expertise as a painter to put anything on it other than a signature. All he really did was find a toilet and declare it to be art. It makes it kind of hard to take the romantic seriously, doesn't it? I don't think this was ever within Duchamp's intent when he submitted Fountain, but that's the point. Who is the artist to control art, to exercise dead-hand control over meaning once a piece is released into the wild to be appreciated by others, especially now that craftsmanship is dispensable? 
1967, French literary critic Roland Barthes put forward the most influential expression of this idea in his essay, Death of the Author, in which he argued the author's intent, background, personal beliefs, and politics exercised an undue level of influence on how we understand and receive a work. We can't ever fully understand the intent of the person who created the piece, nor is it particularly important compared to the creative work that takes place within each of us as we receive and interpret a work. This is all going on in the ivory towers of academic theory, but throughout the century you're seeing these ideas play out sometimes even before academics get to it. Indeed, we witnessed the ideas behind Death of the Author well before Barthes ever put the pen to the paper. As early as 1902, if not before, fans of the Sherlock Holmes stories were attempting to construct a Holmes canon in much the way we understand the word canon today, like how sci-fi and fantasy fans might argue over which works are a definitive part of their fictional universe. These home fans were resolving contradictions, determining which stories are a valid part of the literary canon and which are not. These fans, these Holmesians as they called themselves, were even at the forefront of early efforts of fan fiction. Some 60 years before Barthes proclaimed the death of the author, Sherlock Holmes fans were already elevating the reader and interpreter and fan above the author. These concepts inform not just our concepts of fan fiction and canon, but substantially the whole of American popular culture of the 20th century culture defined by affinity groups and subcultures, by cataloging and separation, by picking apart and remixing, by sampling, by parody, by collage. 20th century pop culture didn't invent all of these things, but it was the first time they all came together to represent this violent break from the romantic era concept of authorship, where one man has a singular stroke of genius and creates brilliant work fully formed without the influence of others and the influence of the context in which it's received. I'd argue Fountain is a big part of the attack on this concept of authorship, and that makes it one of the most important works in the century. Not bad for a toilet. That's it for this episode of Let's Play Community College. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to leave them in the comments. This is Shu. Thanks for watching. Ghost the bastard now, while you still can.